Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Tarak Kamuka, an assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry, and welcome to the seventh lecture of the SciTech STEAM series, an academic outreach program organized by Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. And the purpose of this monthly lecture series is to connect to the young minds of our country, introduce them to the world of scientific discovery, state of the art technologies. And today we have with us Professor Manitipa Banerjee, who is a professor in the Kusuma School of Biological Sciences at IIT Delhi. A little bit of background of Professor Banerjee. Professor Banerjee did her PhD from University of California, San Diego in 2005. She joined the Scripps Research Institute as a postdoctoral fellow afterward. And in 2010, she joined IIT Delhi as an assistant professor. Um, and then currently she is a full professor in KSBS leading fairly a large research group. And she, along with her uh, research team, are working on several projects re relevant to uh, viral infections. In particular, they, they, they study virus host interactions, understanding various complex uh, macromolecular complexes using cryo-electron microscope techniques. So in this lecture, she's going to um, talk about viruses. And I think by now, after two years of the pandemic and, and still going on, we are more curious than ever how these tiny particles and viruses interact with host cells, they enter into our body, and then what is the mechanism by which these guys you know, hijack human cells to reproduce and replicate and cause the viral infection. So the title of the talk is Viruses versus Host, Warfare at Nanoscale. So we're going to see many, many of these interesting things and probably we'll, we'll get to know many um, things that we kind of um, we have heard but but now i think professor Banerjee is going to take us all through you know through all of these uh, small small things that happen inside the cell and uh, so with this um, let me uh, hand it over to professor Banerjee. Uh, before that a bit of technical details so we are um, live on YouTube as well. So during the lecture, you can post your questions. And I think we're going to take a few questions during the lecture, and the rest of the questions we'll take during the question and answer session. So with this, um, I would request Professor Banerjee to start the lecture. Thank you. Professor Banerjee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tarak. Thank you, Shomik. Um, it's a great pleasure to uh, be part of this uh, SciTech uh, SPIN lecture series. And I'm very excited to talk about uh, something that, uh, you know, uh, I have, my group and I have been working on for, for a very long time. That is, uh, how do viruses infect hosts and how do hosts respond and how do infections eventually happen? I think after two years of pandemic, we are all virologists to some extent. And uh, I would, uh, in during the course of this talk, I would try to explain some of the basic processes that are involved in, in the infection uh, caused by viruses and how uh, hosts respond to it. I'm looking forward to an interactive session. Please uh, feel free to uh, type your questions in the chat box. Uh, there are two moderators, uh, two research scholars from IIT Delhi. Uh, Inamur and Piyush, and they would uh, um, interrupt and tell me if there are any uh, questions that I should uh, take in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the talk. And of course, at the end of the talk, there will be plenty of opportunity to ask questions. So let me share my presentation. I hope this is visible to everybody. Yes, it is. It is visible. Perfectly fine. Okay. Great, great. And I will just have my chat box also on. Uh, just in case anybody has. Questions that I should take. OK, so the the title of the talk uh, is virus versus host warfare at nanoscale. Because there are strategies there are uh, from the end uh, from the viral uh, end, then there are responses from the host end, and you will see that there's a there's a lot of uh, interaction, um, and this eventually leads to infection or our immune system gaining the upper hand. Uh, so we will we will go through you know some of these aspects uh, in 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 detail. So 
So um, actually, uh, human civilization, from the beginning of human civilization, uh, we have had close encounters with viruses. Um, there is, if you, and this, this has been documented, uh, viral infections that uh, had happened in, in very early civilizations had been documented. Only at that time, we did not know that there are these infectious, infectious organisms called viruses that are associated with, with uh, the, the symptoms that, that we see here. Um, so this is the mummy of Ramesses V, uh, who was a pharaoh of Egypt. And uh, in the mummy, you can see that there are some lesions which uh, are pointed out by uh, red arrows. Also in the mummy of an unknown child buried somewhere in Naples, again, some lesions which are very reminiscent of smallpox lesions, if, um, if what we have seen in modern times, which indicated that, that these people had contracted smallpox at, at some, some point. Also, if you look at some uh, you, uh, these uh, paintings from ancient Egypt, this is an Egyptian priest, Rome, who is offering um, something to, to the gods, to the deities. And he definitely, the, the image shows that uh, some signs of uh, what we now know as polio, uh, caused by polio virus. So one would see that there are some symptoms caused potentially by viruses, which have been documented in, in very early civilizations. Um, but at that point, again, we, we did not know this. We figured out much later, uh, you know, what are causing these diseases. So Louis Pasteur was a very well-known scientist. He speculated that there must be a pathogen which is smaller than bacteria even, because at that time bacteria was discovered, they were known to cause diseases. Uh, Pasteur first speculated that there must be a pathogen which is even smaller than bacteria. Uh, but is capable of causing deadly diseases. And if that were the case, if size decides, you know, what is bacteria or what is the size is the main difference between bacteria and viruses, then some kind of filtering method would separate the bacterial pathogens from the viral pathogens. So there was a scientist called Chamberlain who developed a filter which would remove bacteria but leave viruses. And, and that was one way, and this is uh, at the uh, bottom right hand corner, you see these Chamberlain filters, which are developed a long time ago, which essentially are, are used to uh, filter out bacteria and, and leave smaller particles, smaller infectious particles, which are viruses. Now, a, a Russian scientist, Dmitry Vanovsky, he isolated uh, uh, an, an extract from tobacco plants. Tobacco plants uh, have this very, uh, at that time, uh, a very difficult disease which, which kills them. And he was trying to figure out what is causing the disease. And he was able to isolate uh, an, an extract which was found to have, uh, found to be the causative agent of the infection. And if you can see on this side, you can see these rod-like little particles. So these were uh, eventually uh, visualized by Wendell Stanley, and they were called tobacco mosaic virus. So the first virus and the first plant virus that was identified was this virus, tobacco mosaic virus. And this was a long time ago, 1892. Although the first vis visualization was in 1935. And a Dutch scientist, Bejering, was the first uh, scientist to reutilize, so to speak, and establish the word virus that was in 1898. So then we knew that there are these viruses uh, which cause diseases in plants. In 1898 also, uh, two scientists found that this foot and mouth disease, uh, which is, uh, you know, ha which happens in cattle, uh, which causes these very painful sores or lesions that again you see on the, on the left hand side of your screen, uh, this is caused by a virus, and that particular virus was called foot and mouth disease virus. Um, so, just a second. Um, so then we we found that uh, uh, viruses can cause plant diseases. Viruses can also cause uh, viruses can cause plant diseases, and viruses can also cause diseases in in animals. 
And um, around the same time, uh, Frederick Tort discovered bacteriophages. Bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria. So then we knew that these are very small infectious agents called viruses, which can cause diseases in plants, diseases in animals, also diseases in bacteria. They can also infect bacteria. And if you look at, um, you know, the, the major epidemics, now we come to the modern, uh, modern era. If you look at the major epidemics or pandemics that have happened in the modern era, you can see a lot of these epidemics or pandemics have been caused by viruses. So one of the very uh, well-known pandemics was influenza, uh, caused by influenza virus in 1918, just at the end of the First World War. Which also was, yes. Uh, one thing, so you need to reshare your screen. Uh, it's oh. gone off. Yeah, just now. Yeah. Let me just try to Thank do you. that. I'm sorry. I hope this is once again visible. Yes, yes. Uh, so it can. Yes, perfect. perfect. Okay, great. So in uh, in the in in the last let's say hundred uh, or so hundred hundred and fifty years. We have had a fair number of pandemics or epidemics, and one of the very well-known ones, as I was mentioning, was the influenza epidemic of 1918, um, and this uh, killed about 100 million people. And after that, we have had other influenza epidemics as well. There was the Asian flu epidemic in 1957, Hong Kong flu in 1968, um, then swine flu in 2009, um, however, the death, the number of deaths are relatively uh, much smaller compared to what happened during Spanish flu. And we will get into that a little bit at the end of the talk, uh, why that was when we discuss uh, virus evolution and our response. And then among other viral uh, epidemics or pandemics, we've had the HIV uh, epidemic as a pandemic is continuing. It has killed about 30 million people. Ebola which causes Ebola hemorrhagic fever. And then obviously uh, pandemics are nothing new to us, right? Because we've been living uh, in the COVID era uh, and we have been dealing with the COVID, uh, the pandemic caused by SARS-CoV-2 for the, uh, this is the third year of the, of the pandemic and it has already killed about 6 million people. So, you know, when we look at this, you know, terrible destruction caused by viruses over, uh, few centuries, we want to ask, you know, what gives them this power? How come they are able to uh, kill so many human beings and they're so small? How, how does this work? How does this happen? So to answer this question, you know, let us first look at uh, viruses in, in detail. What do they look like? And then we'll come to what they do. Okay. So viruses are, hello, am I audible still? Yes, from your audience. Okay, okay. So viruses are infectious obligate intracellular pathogens. These two words are very important. Obligate intracellular, meaning. Um, uh, there is a question regarding example of bacteriophages. So one of the student named Sarah Asif have asked, could you please give example of bacteriophages? I will come to that. Just give me two more, uh, two more minutes. Okay, we will come to that. Okay. We will look at some structures. Okay, ma'am. Uh, so uh, obligate intracellular, these two words are very, very interesting. Obligate intracellular means viruses are unable to multiply by themselves. They require a host cell. They need to get into a host cell. What, what do we mean by host? Uh, anything where the virus is, somebody's house, right? You, you, when you invite guests to your house, then you are a host. Uh, not necessarily that we are inviting viruses in, but the cells where they're multiplying, replicating, we're calling those host cells. So these are obligate intracellular pathogens because they have to be within a host cell in order to multiply. Now they are fairly small. Most of them are between, let's say, 20 to 100 nanometer in diameter, but there are some exceptions. There are very large viruses called Pandora viruses, which have been discovered. 
um, the infectious unit, one infectious unit is called a virion, right? And what is there in a virus which, which makes it so lethal? Well, it carries its nucleic acid, of course. Uh, we know that we carry our genetic code in the form of DNA. Uh, viral nucleic acid could be DNA, it could be RNA, it could be different types of DNA and RNA that, again, we will discuss just in a couple minutes. Uh, now, it is very important that viruses protect this genome or nucleic acid or the genetic code because using this code, they multiply. So, they have very, very stable containers, right? So you put something, if you want to protect it, you put it in a very stable container that, that nobody can, you know, break, right? So these containers are proteins. Uh, proteins, protein make up very stable containers that protect the nucleic acid. And some viruses also have lipids, not all viruses. Some viruses also have lipids, which form a kind of a coat above the protein. Now, someone's asking me, what is the full form of DNA? And someone's already answered, it's deoxyribonucleic acid. This is our genomic material. We, we carry all our information uh, in our DNA. You know, how, how we look like, what is our hair color, what is our eye color, right? How tall are we? All this information is, is there in our uh, DNA. Uh, and uh, someone's mentioning what is the protein coat of the virus. This is called a capsid, in some cases a nucleocapsid, and you will see some pictures in just a second. So the genome size for viruses is typically small. It's on the small side, definitely smaller than bacteria, so they cannot carry around too many genes, which also go to that, goes to that uh, obligate intracellular uh, part, right? Because if they are not carrying too much information, they cannot make too many proteins. Proteins are the things that do most of the work. So if they have to multiply, they do not have access to proteins. Uh, they have to borrow something from the cell, isn't it? So that is what makes them obligate intracellular. So somebody is asking me, uh, what is RNA? RNA is ribonucleic acid. And again, I will show you just in a little bit you know, some of the basic uh, differences between DNA and RNA. We'll come to that in, in just a second. Okay, now here is some interesting information about viruses. They are everywhere. We are surrounded by them. Uh, in fact, biomass of bacteriophages, these are the uh, viruses that infect bacteria. Biomass of bacteriophages is more than the biomass of elephants on Earth, right? Elephants look really huge. There must be a lot of them on Earth. If we add up the biomass, actually that is less than the biomass of just bacteriophages, only bacterial viruses. And there are more viruses in one liter of ocean water than there are people on Earth, right? And this here, uh, what you see on the screen on your uh, right-hand side uh, is actually a picture of bacteriophages. These orange things are bacteriophages, which as you see are trying to infect a bacteria, right? They've surrounded the bacteria, they're trying to infect it. So again, I think, um, you know, some of you are familiar with classification. Um, we all, you know, fall under a certain classification in terms of genus, species. Uh, so viruses are also classified based on, you know, what is the type of, are they carrying DNA or RNA? Um, you know, what is the shape of their protein, protein coat, um, the container which is protecting the DNA or RNA? Um, so according to many different parameters, uh, there is a committee called the International Committee of Taxonomy of Viruses. So they classify viruses, even when, when you, you know, find a new virus, it falls into, you know, one of these uh, classes uh, along the way. And so far, uh, as of 2019, there are 14 orders, 143 families, of, of uh, 5,560 species of different viruses, right? Now, other ways we classify, just in general, you know, all of these also goes into the ICTV classification. Uh, but, you know, we the way we classify viruses in general, uh, some viruses are animal viruses, like, like polio virus, for example. Some viruses are plant viruses, like cucumber mosaic virus, which, which infects cucumbers. 
bacteriophages someone was asking me this question what are bacteriophages can we give some example here if you can see this picture this is a picture of a bacteriophage i'll show you a schematic in a minute so it has a head that is full of genomic material and then it has a tail and one of the examples the image i'm showing here is a bacteriophage called p22 there are a number of other uh, bacteriophages uh, variety of them that are that are available hk97 you know num number of bacteriophages are there and also insect viruses for example cricket paralysis virus that apparently paralyzes insects called crickets right so so host specificity is one way that you can say these are just different types of viruses which have different host types types now shape based viruses do come in different shapes and sizes uh, if you remember the image of the tobacco mosaic virus i showed you right at the beginning of the talk uh, so there are viruses that are rod shaped like like what you see here this is just a more detail we are just seeing more detail of the tobacco mosaic virus right so you can see that there is this ring like structure and this this forms this long rod then there are viruses which are icosahedral in shape what is icosahedral this is a geometric shape that is very, very stable, right? The, the, the reason why, you know, many viruses assume icosahedral shape is because it's very stable. And this, this container, which is icosahedral in shape, inside there's the genome. And the, this, uh, you know, green, blue, and red things that you see on the surface, these are all protein molecules. And the protein molecules are making just, just uh, different protein units that are making this, this beautiful container. And then you have these head tail or complex uh, particles that are bacteriophages. And then you have relatively oblong type of oblong icosahedral structures that you, that you see here. Also one can uh, classify on the basis of whether a virus has lipid, you know, on top of the protein layer, is there another lipid layer, uh, another layer that is made of lipid. And uh, there are viruses which are enveloped, which have the lipid or which are non-enveloped that do not have the lipid. Oleovirus is an example of non-enveloped virus. Uh, enveloped virus example is influenza virus, also SARS-CoV-2 uh, is, uh, is, uh, it, is um, um, it is an enveloped virus. Someone just asked me a very interesting question. Is SARS-CoV-2 an icosahedral virus? It is not. It is uh, what is called a pleomorphic virus. Okay, so it has it has different within the same virus population, there are different shapes and sizes. Uh, this is also an example of pleomorphism. If you look at this influenza virus, you can see different shapes and sizes, right? And SARS-CoV-2 also has a lipid. So it has the nucleic acid that is uh, surrounded by protein and then it has lipid. And within the lipid is embedded a, a protein called spike protein. I think we've all heard a lot about spike protein. And you will see some pictures of the spike protein in just a little bit. Okay. And then another classification can be genome-based classification. What kind of genetic material? How do viruses pass on the information? Different viruses do it in different ways. Uh, they are carrying either DNA or RNA that is containing their, their genetic code. Uh, so there are viruses that uh, contain DNA, like pox virus. There are viruses that contain RNA, that is dengue virus. Uh, now, this there are variations in DNA and RNA that viruses are carrying. It could be, you know, different fragments of RNA. It could be one single long chain of RNA. It could be double chains of RNA, single chain of RNA or DNA, right? So, so there can be a variety, there can be a variety of different types of, of ways for the virus to carry its genomic material. We do not have that advantage. Our genetic uh, information is saved only in double-stranded DNA. I think uh, most of you know that. Okay. So um, now, since we are talking about icosahedrons, uh, one of the very, very interesting facets of many icosahedral viruses is the mathematical principle with which their structures are organized, right? If you look at, you know, this particular, this is a schematic of a virus, um, you can see that here, right here, there is, uh, you know, some symmetry, right? So this is what is called the five-fold rotational symmetry axis. 
And this is something that you may have studied in geometry or you may go and study this in geometry, which means that if you take this, this particular blue unit and I move it every 72 degrees uh, rotationally, I get a similar subunit, right? I can superimpose these. Here, there is a threefold axis of symmetry, meaning 120 degree rotation brings you to the same type of subunit. And there is also twofold rotational axis right here. So 180 degree rotation will bring you to the same kind of uh, structure. So essentially, what we are looking at is a very nice repeating arrangement. And you can see on this image that viruses may be fairly small, they may be fairly large. You see polio virus in relation to what is called herpes simplex virus. This is fairly large. This is relatively smaller. But the overall, this geometric arrangement is, is very same, right? And, and either the virus is using a small quantity of protein, some viruses just use one protein, some viruses use a large number of proteins, but they reach the same kind of geometric form, which is very interesting. And there were two scientists called Casper and Klug who uh, established the mathematical principles behind the construction of these, these viruses. And this is all because it is easier in nature to, to develop a, a, a repeating unit, which is why all this symmetry comes in virus particles, a repeating unit rather than something which does not have any symmetry. So when we talk about in all of these pictures that we have been seeing, how can we see viruses? They're very small. We just discussed that they are at nanometer range. So obviously we can't see them by visible light, we also cannot see them by light microscope because they are so small. We can see bacteria. We cannot see viruses. So we have two ways of looking at viruses with a great degree of detail. Uh, one way is by using electron microscopes, which are using electrons for visualization. And uh, we can see very small particles using electron microscopes. This on, again, your right hand side corner, you see images of a virus. Uh, that my laboratory works on. This is collected on an electron microscope. So we can see, you know, in, in great detail what, what the particles are made out of. Another way is X-ray crystallography. You crystallize the virus particles. And then because the crystal is made out of repeating units, a lot of viruses are making crystal, one can get a diffraction pattern. And from the diffraction pattern, one can try to read a very high resolution structure of a virus, right? So this is actually more physics than biology, that we are using all of these visualization techniques to try to look at viruses in great detail. And when we look at them, uh, you know, there are different databases that are available. Uh, there's something called a protein data bank. Uh, there is something called an electron microscopy data bank. These are all available for anybody to see. There is something called Viper, which is specifically for viruses. You can go to these databases and look at what variation there is in, in terms of structure. Uh, the symmetry elements are remaining the same, but there is so much variation that you see in, in what they look like. Now, the question would be, and if you uh, look at this movie on your screen, again, you will see the very intricate arrangement. So this is all what you're seeing here is the protein shell or the protein container or the capsid, and inside that, the nucleic acid is packaged, right? So why do we need to see this? You know, why do we need to see this at, at uh, you know, this kind of detail? Why do you want to see this much detail of, of viruses? Because the components of the viruses are very, very important uh, to understand. Understanding the components of the virus is very important to understand how it infects. The protein on the out which make up the container, those proteins are the ones that negotiate entry of the virus within the host cell. So the more we know about the proteins, the better it is for us because we can try to, you know, design drugs or uh, if we figure out what a virus looks like, we can generate vaccines. Uh, so, so this is very important because the proteins carry out the, the uh, first part of the infection, the, uh, the protein capsid. And then uh, the nucleic acid, which is inside, uh, this, this contains the genetic codes to make new viruses. Unless a parent virus infects a cell and makes new viruses, the infection cannot proceed, right? 
And then lipids, uh, the lipid shell for viruses which contain the lipid uh, shell, these have embedded proteins which, uh, uh, you know, can again negotiate with the host cells so that the viruses can en enter beneath the cell. Okay. So I'll just very quickly show you two uh, videos. Um, on your left hand side, this is the dengue virus. I'm sure we are all familiar with the dengue virus. And I have color coded the proteins that are available uh, that make up the shell. And the proteins are color coded in green and red and blue. And you can see that there's this five fold axis of symmetry. There's a two fold right there. There's a three fold there, right? So it's, it's a very nice, very symmetric structure. Now on your right hand side, this is human rhinovirus that, um, you know, causes common cold. And again, the, the proteins are color coded. You can see uh, that there are the different types of symmetry that are there. And if we look inside, you see some uh, particles or, uh, you know, uh, some, some red colored dots. So there is a viral component that is present within the capsid, and that is very important. And that is shown in red. So we can cut through the virus and see what is inside. Uh, by using these visual techniques, right? And, and understanding the virus structure in detail is very, very important. Now, before I proceed, uh, are there any questions from the moderators can tell me if there are any questions that are being asked that I should address? Uh, Ma'am, there are some questions on Webex. So they let are asking how the chat box i think uh, let's do that how okay. the so viruses is formed all right okay so i think i gave the example of bacteriophages uh Sar sarah i hope that you have got that information then Dhruv wanted to know what is the full form of dna deoxyribonucleic acid i think ishan has already answered that uh, what is genome size? You know, how long is the genome? We measure it in, in kilo basis. Uh, so we say, you know, each base and then, you know, this uh, thousand base is a kilo base. So different genes which carry our information are of different sizes, right? And depending on how much uh, genome or how much information an organism is carrying, the genome size is proportionately larger. So the viral genome size typically is on the small side compared to other organisms because they steal most of their components from host cells and we'll come to that. Um, I think again, what is the full form of RNA has already been answered. Someone wants to know what is the lifespan of a virus? Can they live like thousand years or so? Shriyansh, if that's okay with you, I will come to the answer for that by the end of the uh, presentation. Then you will see uh, what we are talking about. Biomass is basically just the mass, right? The, the, uh, the biological mass of an organism. And we were just doing a little bit of a comparison between the biomass, total biomass of elephants and total biomass of bacteriophages. Um, I think I already answered that. What is... Uh, is coronavirus icosahedral? I said no. Um, this is a good question. How crystals of viruses is formed? Again, Shriyang's a very, very good question. Uh, one has to actually purify this virus, uh, you know, whichever virus you wish to crystallize. Uh, this is a technique called X-ray crystallography. It takes uh, several years. Uh, so you make large quantities of virus and then you put it in different solutions. Ideally, you're looking for a controlled precipitation so that you get crystals. So it's an integrate process. It takes quite a bit of time, quite a bit of training to get uh, virus crystals. Uh, someone's asking, are capsids and capsomeres the same? Uh, no, actually. So capsomeres, I would define as, uh, you know, uh, the uh, little like units of, oh, somebody has already answered that units of capsid are capsomeres. Yes, that is correct. And let's see, are there any other questions here? OK, I am glad that um, some people are also answering questions, which is very, very nice. 
someone's asking me, can viruses be used to make any material to be piezoelectric? Actually, uh, who is this uh, student? Let me just see. Sorry. Uh, Samrud is asking, can viruses be used to make any material to be piezoelectric? Samrud, there are many actually very interesting applications of viruses. In, in addition to, you know, causing infections and all that, not all viruses are pathogenic, uh, you know, a uh, very small percentage are pathogenic, but there are different uses. And and uh, I can't cover this because this, this talk will then take a very long time, other usages of viruses. But if you contact me later, I can point you to some interesting studies that you can you can go through. Uh, Nidhi asked a very good question. If viruses cannot multiply outside a living cell, how is it cultured in a lab? Nidhi, we culture viruses in labs in cells. So we actually have these plates of cells or, you know, flasks of cells that we grow and then we add viruses to the cells. So viruses will get inside the cells and then they will multiply and then we purify them, right? So the culturing is done in, in cells. And to do that, for every virus, we have to uh, work out, you know, what are the different culture conditions? It, it's not straightforward. So it takes quite a few years to work out, you know, under which condition can we culture a particular virus. And Ian is asking, what type of proteins is coronavirus covered with? Ayan, uh, again, if you give me a couple of minutes, we will come to that um, and I'll show you uh, what coronavirus uh, outer protein looks like. Ah, what is the PDB ID? Uh, okay, so these uh, virus videos that you saw, uh, the images were taken from a protein data bank. Uh, protein data bank is available for anyone to, to go and visualize. These are all uh, structures that have been solved at high resolution and each structure has an ID. So uh, the ID is typically of, of four, uh, you know, digits that you see here, uh, some numbers, some letters, and you can go there and, uh, you know, if you want to look for any particular structure, you can just plug it in and, uh, you know, see um, th that particular structure. Okay, lysogenic and lytic cycles. Um, so, you know, again, I think I will come to that by the end of this talk. Um, and now there are some very specific questions. Cyclic oligonucleotide based antiphage signaling system. Uh, again, I will have to take that a little bit later. Okay. So, uh, if it's okay, shall we move on? Um, are there any questions on YouTube that I should answer? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, someone asked from YouTube like if viruses are living or non living, but the distinction yeah, between. Yeah, I think it's already, yeah. yeah, so they are right at the border, neither this yeah. way nor that way. Yeah. Okay, all right. So now that we have some idea of what viruses look like, let's just, uh, you know, move on and see what they do. Okay, all right. So we come to the next part, which is why do viruses enter cells and how do viruses enter cells? So the why I think is clear. They require cellular resources uh, to, to multiply and unless they multiply and make many, uh, you know, baby viruses, obviously the infection does not proceed. Um, but how do, do our cells allow them to enter, right? Why are we doing that? Um, and we all know, I think, that our cells are surrounded by a membrane. Uh, so our plant cells, plant cells and uh, bacteria are actually surrounded by thick cell walls. So how do viruses get in? Why does that happen? Because our cells, our cell membranes are, you know, they form this barrier which is very specific. Even the movement of water or ions in and out of the cell is very highly regulated. So how does this letting viruses come inside, right? So the entry typically is through some kind of receptor binding, right? What is a receptor? Receptor can be a protein molecule, receptor can be a sugar molecule that is present on the surface of our cells. And viruses have developed in such a way, they have evolved in such a way that they have specific proteins that can bind tightly 
to those components, right? So in case of SARS-CoV-2, the receptor is called uh, ACE2, and we will come to the detail of that in, in just a few minutes. So receptor is an attachment point on the cell surface. Influenza virus on its surface, it has this protein. I think you can see this. Uh, this is one influenza virus, and you can see on the surface there are these fuzzes, and these are a protein called hemagglutinin. This is a blown up view of hemagglutinin. This hemagglutinin binds very tightly to sialic acid, which is found on our cells. Now here we would say, you know, why are our cellular components binding the virus? So why can't we get rid of those components? We cannot do that because these components usually have important functions in our body, right? For example, this uh, ACE2, which is the receptor for coronavirus, actually has a very important uh, function because it helps in maintaining blood pressure. It, it controls the vasodilation process, which is, you know, the uh, sort of um, increase in the diameter of, increase and decrease in the uh, diameter of uh, blood vessels. So it helps in the making of the, um, the hormones which are involved in the process. So it's a very important component. We cannot actually get rid of it or we cannot actually block it because then we would, you know, get very sick anyways. But the virus is able to bind to this particular protein, right? Now, I have written two, uh, you know, two uh, phrases here. One is cellular tropism, another is species specificity. Cellular tropism is a virus will only enter a cell which has that particular receptor, right? If it is geared towards binding that particular receptor, unless it is able, unless that particular receptor is present on a cell type, the virus will not be able to enter that cell type. Similarly, let's say a virus enters a particular organism like birds, right? And it has the proper receptor. Now, it will, may not be able to enter human cells if the same receptor is not available. So this is called species specificity, but sometimes there could also be species jumping. You, you have heard of uh, instances of bird flu or swine flu, right? This is where an influenza virus, which is of bird origin, avian origin, is actually figured out a way of causing infections in humans. And that is one instance of species jumping. How that happens, we will look at it in detail. So, so the receptor, is an entry point. Receptor is the binding point where the virus comes and binds on the outer surface of cells. Now what? Now there is formation of a kind of what is called a vesicle or a, it's like a large bubble which buds from the, so if we consider in this green line is our cellular membrane, from the cell membrane we have these you know little bu bubbles forming which take material inside the cell. And this is actually very important for our, uh, you know, physiology, because through this process, our body also takes in things like food or, or hormones, right? Our, our cells are taking in material this way. And there are different types of these processes. You know, they are characterized in, in many different, uh, there are different pathways through which this happens. And viruses usually exploit one or other of these pathways. So first they will bind the receptor, then they will enter this bubble. And, and these bubbles are called endosomes or caviosomes or phagosomes, right? Now, they are still surrounded by a membrane. The membrane has come from the cell and they have to get in this white space, which is the cellular cytoplasm. Once they're in the cellular cytoplasm, then they can make many copies of their genome and protein. So how do they get into the, basically, only the viral genome needs to be released in the cellular cytoplasm. So how would they break the membrane? That is also very important, the membrane breaching. So there are two ways in which enveloped and non-enveloped viruses do it. Non-enveloped viruses carry certain components which can just break the, the cellular membrane. And enveloped viruses, they typically carry out something called membrane fusion. So remember, they have a lipid envelope and their lipid envelope fuses with the cellular envelope, which is also made of lipid and the viral genome can be released inside the cytoplasm. So the SARS coronavirus enters, you know, through this membrane fusion process, it fuses, fuses its lipid envelope to the cellular membrane. And that is how it actually gains access to the cytoplasm. 
and this here is a is a you know description of how SARS coronavirus SARS CoV two does it. Uh, the glycoprotein on the surface is called uh, the spike protein. This here uh, image, you were seeing the spikes on the surface of the virus. This this is the spike protein. Uh, what you see here is just a blown up version of the spike protein. Usually there is three copies of the spike protein that are together, and then there are many units of these three copies in the in the viral envelope, and it attaches to a human receptor called ACE2. ACE2, the full form is angiotensin converting enzyme. And I already told you that it's very, very important for maintaining our own vasodilation process for correct blood pressure. Now, there are some, uh, you know, some very intricate uh, steps that happen that I'm not going into too much detail here. Uh, but this S protein, each S protein has two parts. The outer part is called S1, the inner part is called S2. S1 binds to the receptor. S2 has the mechanism for carrying out membrane fusion. And for the SARS coronavirus 2 to be infectious, the S1 and S2 components have to be cleaved, separated from each other. And for that, we require, actually the virus requires, some proteases. Proteases are enzymes which cut proteins, right? So this entire S protein has to be cut into two halves, S1 and S2. And that cutting is done by some, some of our own proteases. One of them is furin and the other is TMPRSS2. And uh, actually this, this cutting site is, is one of the hallmarks of SARS coronavirus 2, the reason why it has, you know, it is so infectious it can do that very efficiently so that its entry process it is much faster and more efficient and it can spread, right? So it has mutated to allow this cutting to be very easy. Okay, now what about bacteria and plant cells? How do viruses enter bacteria and plant cells? They have thick cell walls. So typically bacteriophages, and here you see, you know, a schematic of a bacteriophage and here are some, uh, high resolution images of, of bacteriophages infecting, uh, you know, bacteria. This is a bacteria. And these are all phages which are attacking it from, from all sides. So they usually, uh, you know, carry something uh, which are enzymes. They destroy the cell wall. And then they have kind of something that looks like an injection syringe. And they just like, you know, injection syringes used to pump drugs in our system. Similarly, this uh, bacteria, uh, bacteriophage pumps, uses the syringe-like material to pump its genome inside the bacteria. And once the genome is inside, then it can just multiply and, and make lots of virus particles because it has all the information for making the viral proteins as well as to uh, make multiple copies of the genome itself. In case of plants, uh, plants also have very thick cell walls. So if there is a mechanical injury, or through the action of arthropods or nematodes, you know, small animals, or through seeds, infected seeds or pollen, uh, viruses can enter. Or viruses also have enzymes to, uh, you know, cause damage to the cell walls. So this is the way they enter. Now, uh, are there any questions, moderators, on the entry that I should take? Let me just go very quickly to the chat box. See what's happening there. Oops. Okay, I don't see. Ah, I think Harshita was asking the same question. Why our membrane allows the virus to get into our cell? And I think I have already answered that. And Ishan is right. He's saying virus fools the membrane using its proteins. Yes, that is to some extent correct. And Kushal wants to know why do viruses mutate faster than other microorganisms? Actually, Kushal, RNA viruses even mutate faster than DNA viruses. And, and again, we will, we will come to that. We will address that question in, in just a little bit. Okay. So once the virus is inside, um, what does it uh, what does it do? You know, it is inside the genome is inside. 
this is again some some images of the viral genome from influenza and rabies and sendai virus which have been released in cells now what i think some of you are familiar with the central dogma of life but i will just go through it quickly so our genomic matter is all contained in dna and then dna makes rna and rna makes protein right so really quickly dna is where we carry all our genes our genetic code um and what are the genes genes essentially have the blueprints to make proteins proteins are the uh things that do most of the jobs in the cell you know maintaining the cell shape maintaining everything uh ensuring that food and hormones and all you know things are taken inside the cell uh all functions of the body are carried by uh, carried out by proteins so making proteins is very important how to make proteins that information is carried in genes right which are there in our dna now from dna we make mrna or messenger rna the job of the messenger rna is to carry this blueprint to a large number of protein generating machines which are called ribosomes here is a cartoon of ribosomes and the ribosomes essentially with the help of another type of rna called trna can read this code and they make protein for example you know there's a three base code for each amino acid and our proteins are essentially chains of units called amino acids so the way that amino acids what kind of amino acids are are you know making this chain and in which order they are coming uh, will decide you know what is this protein and according to this type of uh, you know amino acids that make up a protein uh, the protein will fold in a certain way and its function will be a, a specific function so the structure of the protein determines its function and the structure is decided by which amino acids are making the protein and in which order and those amino acids what are the amino acids which will make the protein that information comes from our genetic code okay and the proteins are generated by ribosomes now this process where we multiply our dna we have to do that for cell division right so that and process is called yes there's a question someone is asking someone is asking what is codon is what codon are what are codons uh yes, codons are these three uh, three bases at a time right these code for each of these three bases at a time code for one specific amino acid so there is something called a genetic code and you will probably you know learn that uh, a bit later in in your uh, coursework uh, where all our proteins are made out of 20 amino acids there are 20 amino acids in in the world and all our, all of our proteins are made from these 20 amino acids in different permutations and combinations and in, in which in our genetic code there are three bases which each of these three bases code for one particular amino acid for example gua um codes for valine ugc codes for cysteine right and these bases come from our dna converted to mrna and converted to protein right so the genetic code is essentially the blueprint of life it it tells our body how to you know what protein to make in which proportion and that decides everything that we are is essentially in, in our genes like you know you say you got your blue eye color from your father or you are tall like your you know your uh, father or your hair is curly like your mother's right so all of this information flow of genetic information comes to us obviously from our parents that is in dna and then this is uh, this information is is uh, provided to mrna and from mrna we get using this code we get uh, proteins made in our cells and they decide all the physical characteristics right so essentially um in our body we you know we uh, obviously multiply our dna and then this process is called replication and then conversion of dna to rna we call that transcription and from rna to protein we call that translation in case of viruses remember that they may not have dna at all they may be carrying all their information in rna right so then they will make rna from rna because they need to make many copies of their genome and many copies of their protein and they will also need to make protein okay so so this is very important once the viral genome is within the cell 
now they will make many copies of the genome and many copies of the protein so that they can all assemble together and now you have lots of viruses in the cell right and these these areas are called viral factories so basically the virus is taking over all our resources because in our body we are constantly you know converting dna to rna rna to protein uh, we require a lot of uh, components to do that right so we have you know something called a dna polymerase which makes dna from dna RNA polymerase, which makes RNA from either DNA or RNA, ribosomes, which are these protein making factories, uh, lipids, which make membranes. We, we all we have these things, uh, but viruses, uh, they do not carry too many genes. OK, so they can't make that many proteins. So what do what would they do? Uh, they, they let's say they require a DNA polymerase to make DNA from DNA, right? Uh, but they haven't carried the gene for it. So they will just steal it from us. Uh, they, viruses never carry ribosomes, right? Ribosomes are, are the protein making factories. So how would they make protein? They will basically just take over our cellular resources. And here on the uh, right hand, uh, sorry, left hand side, I just want to show you, this is an example of a viral factory. This is a cell. And this where the virus is uh, essentially multiplying and it's making so many copies of itself. Each one of these dark units, this is an icosahedral virus, so you can even make out an icosahedral spherical shape of the virus. So it's just making large quantities of these virus particles. And, and obviously, since the virus is, you know, it's bringing very little, but it's borrowing and stealing from us, uh, we are now at a disadvantage because our cells now cannot sustain because our resources have been taken over by viruses. Uh, another very uh, important thing, I think this image is somehow not showing up. Let me try to show it to you. Just a second. I can remove this window a bit. Ah, here you see, uh, if you can see this image on the top right hand corner, there is a virus that is budding out. So viruses make their proteins, they make their genome, they never make lipid. They steal lipids from our membranes. So this is a virus particle that is budding out and it's stealing our membrane lipid. Now, obviously, if, if this happens, if viruses have taken over in, in this sort of way, then they are essentially, you know, really damaging our cells. So, so what is happening to the infected cells? So our functions now are shut off. Uh, we can't make any protein and without protein, we don't have, we cannot carry out any function because this is all being taken up by viruses. Our own messenger RNAs are degraded by viruses, destroyed by viruses because they want their messenger RNAs to make protein. And sometimes when the viral load becomes too much, our cells burst, right? Because there's, there's just too much virus. So if you see this picture, this is actually a lot of viruses. This is just one cross section of a cell. And here is the cell membrane. And you can see that there has been significant damage to the cell membrane because it's kind of bursting and viruses are all going out, right? But in some cases, and I think someone asked me a question about lysogeny, sometimes the viral genome can become incorporated in the host genome. And someone also asked me the, the function of an enzyme called integrase. Integrase is present, you know, one of the most well-studied integrases is in HIV, uh, human immunodeficiency virus. And what that does is that it integrates its genome. So it has an RNA genome. It makes double-stranded DNA out of it, and it puts it along with our genome so that when we are replicating our genome, we're also replicating the viral genome, right? And integrase is the en enzyme which carries out this integration process. It's a very integrate way of working. So viral genome can remain in our genome for a long time. But while this process is going on, you know, the cells are bursting due to viral load, lots of viruses are, are being uh, generated. So what do our cells do during this process? So our cells give out what are called distress signals. They make things called you know, um, uh, essentially, uh, you know, chemicals which which alert our immune system, and our cells also, if they if they uh, are infected by viruses, have a way to commit suicide. Right? Cellular suicide is a very 
step by step, very intricate process. It's called apoptosis. So when cells are infected by viruses, they have a way to commit suicide. What would that do? That would prevent the multiplication of the virus and spreading of it in surrounding areas, right? So, and while all this is happening, what is happening to the organism? I think we all have seen examples of viral infections. This is an example of polio. This is an example of dengue fever. This is an image of SARS-CoV-2 that is in pink. It is infecting the epithelia of the lungs that you see in, in blue. These are, uh, you know, essentially uh, plant produce, uh, vegetables that are infected by, by different viruses. So we know that viruses can do a lot of damage. So that brings me to the question, well, if that is the case, then how did we survive so far? We are saying we are surrounded by viruses. There are so many bad things viruses can do. They have a way to get inside. They can find receptors. They can undergo, you know, replication, transcription, translation, make so many copies of themselves and then go out and infect surrounding cells. So how do we manage? Because we have viruses coming in through air, viruses coming in through human contact, through bloodstream, through contaminated water. So what is the question? What is the answer to this? The answer is because we have a very, very good immune system. Um, what does the immune system do? Again, not going into too much detail, just, you know, the, the basics. Our immune system can be divided into two parts. One is an innate immune system. Another is an adaptive immune system. Innate immune system uh, gives a quick response. It recognizes patterns. Uh, let's say it will recognize an RNA virus. It cannot tell whether it's chikungunya or dengue, but it will recognize that this is an RNA virus, right? Uh, and it, it is a very quick response. So, so it tries to, you know, kill viruses that, uh, that you know, it, it recognizes some kind of intruder. Of course, before the innate immune system, we also have our barrier immunity, uh, which is not, uh, you know, a traditional part of the immune system, but it does help uh, for, to protect us our skin, our mucus, the fact that our gastric pH is very low, those things really, uh, you know, take care of a lot of pathogens and not allow them to come inside. But then the innate immune system gives a quick response and then the adaptive immune system kicks in in about five to seven days. This is a slower response, but this is a much stronger response. And it's long lasting. It recognizes specific signature on the, on the surface of the virus and it retains memory. So whenever we talk about, you know, if we have an infection virus, we should not get that virus again. We are talking about the adaptive immune system because this is the part that retains memory of the, the pathogen that it has seen before. Um, so as I said, innate immune system is the first responder and it re recognizes non-specifically, meaning it cannot recognize, you know, a specific protein let's say it will not be able to recognize that this is, um, you know, the spike protein, right? But it recognizes by some kind of pattern, right? And then, then it, it signals to, to these uh, cells which are able to engulf and eat uh, pathogens. So I'll, I'll show you a video in a second, but I just want to mention that the innate immune system is actually evolutionarily conserved. So even, you know, the lower animals, they have the innate immune system. And the adaptive immune system we see from the time of the early vertebrates. And again, this is a very quick response. And the adaptive immune response usually happens in a week, week's time, but it is slower, but it is much stronger. So let's look at very quickly, uh, you know, uh, a picture of what the immune system, innate immune system is capable of. Now, this is a neutrophil. This is a, a cell that can, uh, you know, eat up, chew up a pathogen. This is a bacteria, not a virus, but the principle remains the same. So you can see that these are all red blood cells. And this is the neutrophil. And it is going for the bacteria, right? And the bacteria obviously is trying to swim away. So similar uh, situation with viruses. So it is just trying to chase it down. And where is it? There. So it engulfs and it chews it up. Right? 
So it has basically, uh, this is the kind of, uh, you know, cells that we have in our immune system. This is the kind of response. Now, as the path is, as the, uh, you know, cells of the innate immune system chew up the viruses, they also present the fragments to the adaptive immune system. This is called antigen presentation. Now, here I'm introducing a couple of words, which is antigen and antibody. I think we all know a little bit about antibodies, right? Can can someone write in chat box if, if you know about antibodies? Let me just stop here and see what kind of questions are there in the chat box. Do most people know about antibodies? Ah, I see some very interesting questions here. People are saying, what are the main components needed for making viruses artificially and in what ratio they combine? Samrud, you are asking some very good questions. Uh, virus assembly in vitro. In vitro is something that happens outside of the cell, in, in tubes. Uh, for very few viruses, we know how to assemble them in, in vitro, even if we know what are the main components, right? So, so for most viruses, this process is uh, intricate and difficult to carry out, uh, you know, outside a living cell. Okay. Why isn't DNA replication 100% accurate? It's not, and RNA replication is even less accurate because these enzymes make mistakes. Every time these enzymes make mistakes, we are uh, in a situation, uh, I mean, obviously there are mutations, uh, you know, introduced in the, in the genome, and that makes mutated proteins on the surface of viruses. Now that mutated protein may give the virus some, some uh, additional advantage. If it does, then those viruses will take over, uh, as we are seeing with the Omicron variant, right? Uh, if if, uh, if uh, they cannot, if they do not give a selective advantage, then they are destroyed. Now, cell is engulfed by ribosomes. That is not really correct. Ribosomes are present in the cytoplasm, and these are protein-making factories. So they make protein in, in the cells. Okay, let me see if there are any other questions. Ah, cells have a defense mechanism of cytokine barrier. Why is it not sufficient to protect us from viruses? Because viruses also have ways of their own to get over it, Rahul. So actually, um, that is why I called it warfare at nanoscale, because the strategies we have, viruses have counter strategies, and then we have counter counter strategies, and so it goes. Okay, so I think everyone uh, knows about antibody a little bit. Um, yes, so antibodies, I think everybody has heard of to some extent. Right, Acha. so someone is asking me, again, Samrud is asking, why innate immune system is important? As we know, adaptive immune system is better. Because Samrud, many infections are just cleared out by the innate immune system because it's a fast responder. Adaptive immune system takes a while to kick in, about seven days, right? So if the innate immune system was not there, and if we were not vaccinated, if we did not have memory of the previous and uh, um, you know previous pathogen, then we would be in dire straits. If you're only uh, waiting for the adaptive immune system response to come in, okay. I think I've answered the cytokine question. Okay, so I think uh, a lot of people have said that they uh, understand what are. Uh, a lot of people have said they understand what are antigens and antibodies, which is good. But just to give you, you know, very brief overview, the two types of two major types of cells in our uh, adaptive immune system are B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. And you will sometimes see this in your blood test. You know, if your B lymphocyte, T lymphocyte numbers are down, that is not good for us because then we are not able to deal with infections. So, um, Essentially, B lymphocytes have uh, generate antibodies. Each B lymphocyte makes only one kind of antibody, and antibodies are receptors that bind to antigens. Now, antigens can be any viral protein, 
it can actually be any foreign protein, anything that is foreign. Okay. And these antibodies are essentially natural miracles because they have a variable region that can essentially bind to millions of antigens. Any antigen has in the universe, that is there in the universe, we can have an antibody that will bind to that particular antigen. Uh, so antibodies are present on the surface of B lymphocytes and they are also released in circulation and they go and bind viruses and destroy them. Also, there are uh, T lymphocytes, which actually have receptors to bind to infected cells. And so they can engulf the entire infected cell. So let's say the virus is within the cell and T lymphocytes can recognize through the receptor that this particular cell appears to be virus infected. They can engulf and destroy infected cells. And as I said, theoretically, B and T cells can recognize millions of foreign proteins or foreign antigens. So there is something called, uh, as, uh, which is called uh, um, essentially a, a proliferation uh, uh, theory, which uh, is a selection theory, which essentially uh, says that each one of these B lymphocytes or T lymphocytes can have one particular type of anti, uh, antibody or receptor on the surface. Now, when you provide an antigen, when a particular antigen is available, which binds specifically to one particular receptor. Now, this is a lock and key thing. If you look at the shapes of these receptors or antibodies, you can see that this particular antigen will only bind this particular receptor, not the others, right? Because the shape does not match. So when the shape matches, that particular B or T cell is selected and it multiplies many times. And so that antibody or that T cell receptor is available to deal with the pathogen if this antigen comes from a pathogen. And some of these are also saved in memory. What does it mean? Next time we see the same antigen, we will have a very strong B lymphocyte or T lymphocyte response because we've already saved, we've already recognized this from previously and we have some of these cells saved in memory. Now, what do viruses do? So this was the question. This was what someone was asking me. You know, if uh, our body can do so much, you know, cytokine response, um, this innate immune system, adaptive immune system, T cells, B cells, everything is there. So, so how do viruses take over? <coughs> so viruses continually try to look different. There is antigenic variation. They try to change the surface proteins so that it looks different and it's not readily recognized by the immune system. Viruses also try to block phagocytic cells or antibodies or T cells. The molecular mechanisms are very intricate, so I'm not going into it. They can also suppress the immune system and they can also stay in, uh, in a lysogenic state or in a latent state. So what can we do? We have our countermeasures and then viruses have counter countermeasures. So what is our option? Can we give a little bit of help to the immune system? Yes, we can we can vaccinate, right? Because if we do, then we are saving some memory B and T cells, which results in our uh, adaptive immune system response being much faster. So that viruses cannot take over our cells or over the entire organism because our adaptive immune system has already kicked in very fast and it has the antibodies, it has the B lymphocytes that make the specific antibodies, and it also has the T lymphocytes, which can kill the infected cells. So what do we do when we do vaccination? We expose our immune system to the pathogen, not the infectious pathogen, but some kind of treated pathogen, so that we stimulate an immune response and we store that in memory. That is the purpose of vaccination. And vaccines, as we know, are very effective. We are seeing, we have seen that with the Salk polio vaccine, which is one of the very, uh, you know, effective vaccination drives in, in 1954. We are seeing this again with SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. And this was a very famous uh, experiment done by Dr. Alan Warner in 1901 to look at the efficacy of smallpox vaccine. So these were two kids who were infected side by side with smallpox. And this kid was vaccinated before, this, uh, this kid was not. So although this uh, person was able to still, some virus was still replicating in his body, 
and he was able to spread the virus. But you can see that his physiology looks completely different from the unvaccinated individual. And, uh, you know, what do we put in vaccines? We can take the virus and inactivate it, which is our co-vaccine. We can make a chimeric vaccine, take the protein from the infectious virus, put in on it, it on a relatively non-infectious virus. This is our COVID shield. We can take a virus and grow it in such a way so that it looks the same as the wild type virus, original virus, but it's unable to cause disease. This is our measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, and most of you have had it in your childhood. Then there is subunit vaccine where we just take the protein from the cells and we, we uh, inject that in people. So this is a hepatitis B virus vaccine. So we have all kinds of different types of vaccines available. And uh, the, the new vaccine formulations which have come in uh, during SARS-CoV-2 infection is the mRNA and, and DNA vaccines. So essentially mRNA, uh, you know, it corresponds to the particular protein on the surface of the virus that, that it encodes. And this mRNA is introduced into, injected in our body, it goes into our cells makes the protein, and then we raise an immune response against that particular protein. So you may have heard of Moderna vaccine, right? So this is the mRNA vaccine. This is a new type of vaccine. And vaccines are very, very thoroughly tested to make sure that they are safe. So there is a preclinical evaluation followed by phase one and phase two and phase three trials, where you have lots of volunteers and it's it's randomized process so uh, we check for uh, the, the vaccine make makers check for uh, all kinds of factors like you know whether it is causing any toxic reaction how long does it protect how many variants does it protect against does one need a booster shot right so all of these things are taken care of before vaccines are actually deployed and the goal of a vaccination drive is to make sure that we achieve herd immunity if only a small proportion of the population gets the vaccine, then it is not effective because the disease can still spread. However, if the majority of the population gets the vaccine, then the chances of it spreading is less, right? So herd immunity is very important. So the next uh, aspect would be, uh, let me again, you know, stop here and take some questions. Okay. So someone wants to, someone is asking me. Let me see, where did this start from? Antibodies also known as this immunoglobulin, that is correct. Um, I cannot answer that. Hydrala, I'm not really sure. Uh, Samrut is asking, what is the main difference between Covaxin and Covishield? Covaxin Samrud is made from the uh, actual SARS-CoV-2. So one makes large quantities of SARS-CoV-2 and then it is inactivated. Uh, the inactivation process for you know, inactivated viruses typically through some kind of chemical or heating or something so that it is no longer able to cause the disease, but it still looks very similar to the original virus. So it will not multiply, it will not replicate, but our immune system gets to recognize it and keeps the memory. Covishield, on the other hand, takes the spike protein of SARS coronavirus 2 and puts it on a, uh, on a, you know, adenovirus, which is a different virus, uh, the partic uh, virus like particles. So, so this, it's a chimera, right? You, you know what a chimera is. It's a combination of two different things. Um, so, this virus is again unable to, uh, you know, multiply and cause disease, but it will display the spike protein on the surface. And that will be recognized by our immune system. So that is the main difference. Okay. Someone's asking me, how is the virus able to put on a new form? Or I think you're talking about virus evolution and we're just going there. Uh, DNA vaccine I know is available and it has been tested. It is effective. Uh, in microorganism, does virus undergo rapid variation? Viruses do undergo rapid variation. Uh, that is because they're uh, during uh, multiplication of their genome, their enzymes make mistakes. And, and again, we will go there. What vaccine does Moderna have? It is an mRNA vaccine. Uh, Shreyansh, this is an mRNA corresponding to the, which has the code for making the spike protein. And this is introduced in our cells. So then our cells will make the spike protein 
and then that our immune system will raise a response against it. Uh, which vaccine is more effective? I think all of the vaccines have been tried and tested. They're all showing good uh, efficiency against uh, prevention of disease. Can vaccines have any side effects? Vaccines are tested in literally thousands of individuals to check for side effects. Now, that is not to say that, uh, you know, the kind of side, it depends very much on the physiology of an individual. In some individuals, vaccines can have some mild side effects, and we are actually told, you know, what to do, what not to do after taking a vaccine. But in the majority of the people, there are no discernible side effects. Okay. Now, uh, now that we've discussed vaccines, you know, that is a strategy for prevention. Now, what is the strategy for cure? Uh, if we do get a uh, viral infection and if we haven't taken a vaccine um, and if our uh, immune system is unable to cope with it, then how do we uh, do we actually have any drugs? Making viral drugs is antiviral drugs, so to speak, is a little bit complicated because, as you saw, viruses are borrowing too many things from us. So. The way viruses multiply, they beg or borrow or steal so many material from us that if you're making a drug against those processes, it's also hurting our cells. But there have been several different types of antiviral uh, drugs that are available, which are very specific to viral components, uh, like, for example, making RNA from RNA. We never make RNA from RNA. So we do not have an enzyme to make RNA from RNA, but viruses do they make uh, RNA because they carry RNA genome. So, so they make RNA from RNA. We only make RNA from DNA, right? So we can target those enzymes, which are called RNA-dependent RNA polymerases. And that the virus will carry because it knows that the host cell does not have it, right? Then there are other viral proteases, which are, which are important. Uh, influenza virus, for example, has, uh, has a protein called neuraminides, which uh, you know is important for releasing the virus new virus from cells so we have drugs against that in fact the tamiflu that we take for for bird flu is actually uh, that uh, targeting neuraminidase uh, so there are different types of uh, antiviral drugs less in number but they are available and they block polymerases or reverse transcriptases or proteases or neuraminidase so these are the viral components that one targets for generating antiviral drugs now, the last part is, you know, so, so how do we get the new viruses? You know, what, what happens? So one has to understand that viruses are mutating all the time. Every time viruses are replicating, there are mistakes introduced into the uh, viral genome. As a result of the mistakes, instead of a particular amino acid, virus may have a different amino acid in a protein at a specific location. And that is exactly what we are seeing for, um, you know, the different variants of SARS-CoV-2. So uh, it may give the virus some selective advantage because of an alteration in one amino acid or a few amino acids. It may be able to bind more tightly to its receptor. That creates a natural selection so that now those viruses dominate the population because they can transmit more easily, right? But although viruses are accumulating new mutations all the time, most of them do not become pathogenic. And the instances of epidemic spread is very low because there exist strong biological and ecological barriers at every step. So you will ask me what happened with the pandemic? How, did, uh, how are we suddenly in the middle of a pandemic? So I think many, many different you know, um, not only genetic and biological factors, but also environmental factors and ecological factors and many other factors came together to create the uh, pandemic condition. Because, you know, it is possible for viruses to evolve, they are evolving continuously, for natural selection to happen and for species jumping to happen and for viruses to adapt to a new host. For example, influenza virus, uh, the 1918 pandemic virus was uh, eventually found to be a bird flu virus, which suddenly jumped to humans. And, and when you look at these different nomenclatures of, uh, of uh, influenza virus, some H1N1, H5N1, 
H3N5, whatever it is. This H stands for hemagglutinin, guys. This is the protein that binds to the receptor. And N stands for neuraminidase. So the virus can have many different types of hemagglutinin. It can have many different types of neuraminidase. And using these, it can try to move to another species. For example, uh, the bird flu virus that jumped from birds to humans during the 1918 pandemic. What happened there? Typically, uh, the human flu virus binds to sialic acid. Sialic acid is attached to galactose on our cell surface using a 2,6 linkage. And bird flu hemagglutinin, it binds to sialic acid, which is attached to galactose with a 2,3 linkage. So usually the cavity that is required for accommodating this human sialic acid is a little, has to be a little bit larger. But the bird flu virus did not have that. The bird flu virus hemagglutinin did not have that. When it accumulated one specific mutation, one amino acid at position 190 was changed, 190th amino acid, this cavity became a little larger so that the human sialic acid could now be incorporated. So this was one of the, you know, one of the major uh, ways in which the influenza virus, the, the bird flu virus or the Spanish flu virus actually jumped from birds to humans because this particular mutation, this one mutation gave it a huge advantage. This is the natural selection and adaptation in the host. So then you will ask what happened to SARS-CoV-2. I think the jury is still out on that one. Uh, the first SARS-CoV, the first uh, coronavirus was supposed to have uh, <clears throat> first jumped from bats to uh, civet cats and then to humans. Uh, in case of the MERS outbreak, MERS was another coronavirus which caused an outbreak <clears throat> in the Middle East in, I think, 2010, 2011. And that was supposed to have jumped from bats to camels to humans. Uh, in case of SARS-CoV-2, <clears throat> we are still collecting data. Uh, it is possible that the species jumping has been from bats to pangolins to humans, but there is still uh, quite a lot of you know studies that need to do need to be done regarding this. Uh, but what we are seeing in front of us are a lot of SARS-CoV-2 variants, right? So we have the Omicron variant, we had the Delta variant. So what is happening? You know what? How are these variants important? What are the mutations? And again, you may have read this in the newspapers. So, uh, as I mentioned, in compared to SARS, the first SARS coronavirus, the SARS coronavirus 2 is, is more effective. Why is it more able to spread more effective? Because this S1 to S2 cleavage is, is more effective. It has a, a site which makes this cleavage very uh, effective. As a result, the S protein also becomes more uh, unstable. So there is one particular mutation which is at position 614 of the spike protein, which actually makes the spike protein more stable. So, so this gives it a, a selective advantage. The, the particular virus, the variant which has this mutation has a selective advantage. Then N501Y, this again is a little bit more effective, but lots more effective because this binds more effectively to the receptor. This one mutation at position 501 makes the virus bind more tightly to the receptor. Then this E484K, uh, this is a mutation which is called an immune escape variant. When this particular amino acid is altered, uh, if we already have existing antibodies because of a previous infection or because of you know some kind of uh, you know vaccination, uh, the virus can evade those antibodies to some extent, not completely, but to some extent. So if we ask, you know, what do we expect in future? It is very, very hard to tell. I don't think anybody can predict, um, you know, what, uh, because again, you know, the mutations lead to some kind of natural selection. And uh, then the natural selection results in, you know, some viruses adapting better, some strains adapting better, and those are the ones that are circulating. So whether, you know, SARS-CoV-2 will gradually become less virulent and we would just get seasonal infections. Um, I cannot tell you. I don't think anybody can really tell uh, you know, this with uh, confidence. But the influenza virus pandemic in 1918 has been followed by you know, relatively smaller 
outbreaks, which has also killed a lot of people, but but relatively smaller compared to what had happened in 1918. So it it may be possible that we are going in that direction, but again, it is it is impossible to predict what will happen. So what does the future hold? Uh, there was a very famous uh, scientist who worked on pathogens, pathogenic bacteria, actually, and he got a Nobel Prize at the age of 33. His name was Joshua Lederberg. And he made a statement which I think is very, very uh, applicable to us, which is the future of humanity and microbes will probably unfold as episodes of a suspense thriller that could be titled Our Wits Versus Their Genes. See, viruses are capable of, you know, evolving very fast and due to natural selection, then they, some strains become dominant and then they become easily transmissible. We do not have the advantage of very quickly changing our, you know, genome. But what we have is our wits and what we have seen in the in the pandemic in the last uh, couple of years is that we developed vaccines very fast. We figured out ways of isolation, quarantine. Nothing was perfect. Of course, a lot of people died and they're still dying, which is, which is very, very unfortunate. But uh, to some extent, we could uh, prevent, uh, prevent deaths and infections. And, and that is why we always need our wits to deal with microbes, which, which come with very, very adaptable, uh, mutable um, possibilities, right? There are literally millions of possibilities. So I'm going to end with this. Uh, thank you very, very much for your patience. I realized this took a long time and I am very happy to take questions. I think there are quite a lot of questions. Let me first go to the chat box. Okay. Okay, so I had left it at the mRNA position. Uh, so someone's asking, how does virus actually cause disease? So they cause large scale disruption in our in our system. So that is what makes us very, very sick. And and there are, you know, other effector proteins that I did not discuss that may have very, spe very specific, uh, you know, symptoms that that we see. Ma'am, is it possible to make an antibiotic which can identify its target organ and before multiplication of that virus, we could kill that? So, Samrit, that is, uh, you know, what you are saying, obviously, you know, people are trying to work towards that, right? Um, antibiotics are not for viruses, though. They are for bacteria. For viruses, we have antivirals. Um, the, the idea is if one has to develop drugs against viruses, uh, we have to target uh, those aspects of the viruses which are not common to us or common with us. For example, when we target bacteria, we target bacterial ribosomes because bacteria bring their own ribosomes and they are different from our ribosomes. In case of viruses, we cannot target that aspect because viruses use our own ribosomes, right? So we that is why we need to understand uh, what viruses look like, what do their proteins look like? What is it that they do? You know, which receptor is it binding to? So if we if we understand that, uh, then then one can try to develop, you know, even uh, uh, something that that might uh, prevent, you know, viral attachment. Uh, for example, if one makes something that that prevents uh, attachment of SARS-CoV-2 to the receptor. Uh, but again, this is a very complicated process, and and sometimes those things can also be toxic to us. So so that is uh, certainly a possibility, but one has to look at uh, all the other aspects of uh, such uh, phenomenon. Okay. So someone is asking, Sarah is asking, when DNA of virus combines with other our DNA with the help of restriction enzyme, then how they multiply with the help of our DNA? Okay, that's that's a good question. So their DNA has become part of our DNA, right? So when we are replicating our DNA, we are also replicating the viral DNA. But under certain conditions, that you know that particular DNA it remains quiescent, but then it can start making new viruses. So it suddenly starts making protein. It is no longer quiet, and then you have you know the viral replication, and then you have lots of viruses, and then the symptoms start to appear. 
right? So, so it's not restriction enzymes per se, but restriction enzymes are necessary. We use them in the laboratory, but uh, there are viral enzymes which, which carry out uh, these functions. Okay. Then Aditya is asking, after entering the host cell, is there a question? Okay, Aditya was explaining. Okay, all right. Um, okay, Kushal is asking a very good, very interesting question. Does virus only cause infections or diseases to humans or are they friendly also? Uh, <laughs> not all viruses, I think I mentioned that a very small percentage of viruses are actually pathogenic, right? So, um, and, and you know, we, we use uh, viruses for, for various things. You know, viruses are such good uh, containers, right? They, they, their job is to protect the genome, uh, take it to a cell, release it in the cell. So, you know, many laboratories around the world are trying to see if they can exploit that property, remove the viral genome and fill it with some drugs or something and, and see if it can go to a particular cell type, right? Uh, medicines or you know, chemotherapeutic drugs, uh, those things. So certainly they can be beneficial. Okay. Uh, Disha is asking, why isn't the COVID shield vaccine given to people under 18? Um, I think that, uh, you know, I think testing and all is still undergoing. I am unable to comment on this, but uh, when this uh, different phase trials this is a general answer, uh, phase one, phase two, phase three, then they get volunteers from different age groups. So at first, the concern was to give it to relatively elderly people and then to middle aged people like me. And then eventually, once all the trials and testings are done, I'm sure that it will become available. Um, someone's asking, why is there still a debate on whether virus is living or non living? I don't think there's a debate. I think we should just say that viruses are borderline cases and leave it at that. You know, let's not take one way or the other. Uh, Rahul has also asked a very interesting question. Can we form a vaccine which can cope up any mutant variant of individual infected virus? Um, I wonder if we can get Rahul to speak. Is, is that possible? Uh, moderators or... Um, because I would really, huh? Is it is it possible for to allow Rahul to speak? To, uh, you know, specifically ask this question. This is a very interesting question. Uh, so Rahul Kevat or Rahul Raj? And then shall I also stop sharing? Yes. So uh, Rahul is unmuted, so he can he may speak. Okay, let me first just stop sharing. All right. So Rahul, can you turn your video on, please? Yeah, ma'am. Hmm? Good evening, Rahul, where are you from? You are asking a very, very interesting question, which is why I wanted to see you uh first of all thanks ma'am for this compliment uh, i'm from bihar basically i'm studying in kendri vidyale pusa i see i see okay uh, guys rahul has asked a very interesting question which many laboratories in the world have been trying to answer uh, that can we make vaccines which can uh, you know uh, deal with um, any mutated variant and this uh, problem we have been dealing SARS-CoV-2 is relatively new but this problem we have been dealing with with influenza virus for a very long time right so Rahul the answer to your question is it may be possible if we target one part of the the protein in in case of SARS-CoV-2 for example it's the spike protein which is primarily targeted to make vaccines because it's so visible on the virus surface and our immune system is geared towards responding, you know, primarily to spike protein. But there are other proteins also in the virus like nucleocapsid and envelope protein and uh, membrane protein, which all, you know, uh, there is there are immune responses against those proteins as well. But because spike protein is the most uh, visible, uh, the, the uh, major responses against that. 
and the uh, you know the similar protein in influenza virus is hemagglutinin which is the one that binds to the receptor it's very uh, exposed um, so if we can find one part of the protein that is stable that does not undergo mutations or too many mutations because this gives the virus a selective advantage then that part we can potentially focus on to make a vaccine which will work against multiple variants and to some extent this was in works with influenza because hemagglutinin has a part which is it does not vary too much and and uh, you know some scientists saw that you know uh, people have broadly neutralizing antibodies broadly neutralizing antibodies are those which uh, can neutralize or take care of you know multiple influenza strains so they found that those antibodies are generated by the immune system against that part of the protein which does not change right it it does not change uh, you know in 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 different strains or does not change too much because it gives the protein a selective advantage uh, it it keeps it stable and and the stock portion is the uh, invariable region keeps it uh, you know uh, the um, the variable region capable of interacting with the receptor so if we can identify some part of the protein which does not change or any other protein in the in the uh, you know in the virus which do not change or if we can make a vaccine which will generate immune response against all of the proteins that are present in the virus not only the one that changes very much but also the others which do not change very much then the chances of immune uh, protection will be high uh, rahul i i hope that answers your question uh, and, and yes ma'am people are working towards that yeah but but thank you for a very very good question okay all questions are good but this was extra special all right so let me see um someone uh, shreyanks is asking can a virus live for 1000 years or so um <laughs> so uh you know it, it doesn't matter really i mean as long as it can mutate and it can you know um uh, keep species jumping then then it is all the more dangerous for us uh is vashya is asking is taking a vaccine more effective or taking drugs after the disease is better i would also we always say that taking a vaccine is more effective because why would you want to get sick if you can prevent it right prevention is always uh more desired than you know when you actually get the disease and you're going through the symptoms and then you're taking a drug so so if there is an effective vaccine and that can prevent a disease it's always better to take it okay and i think ishan has already uh, responded okay majority of people suffering with covid are also diagnosed with pneumonia see these are there are different reasons right i mean i cannot uh, you know answer this question uh, you know uh, because it's it's not really you know there, there isn't one answer um so there is there is significant lung damage that is caused by sars cov2 because the receptor for sars cov2 when it comes through our respiratory tract our nasal epithelia meaning the cells within the nose and the upper respiratory tract and the lungs uh we we have a lot of ac2 receptors uh so uh that that problem is there uh plus you know there are also you know gi tract infections uh these uh, these things happen with cov2 and that's because we have large number of receptors in our colon as well kidneys as well right uh now sometimes when a person is suffering from a uh, viral infection there could also be opportunistic bacterial or viral infections which can also you know uh, show some of the symptoms so it it's really a, a case by case thing it is hard to say that there is one general uh, you know reason for this shreyans wants to know uh, how a cell commit suicide okay this is a process that is called apoptosis uh when a cell gets a signal and the signal may be of different types um that uh, it, you know then it it is told that it is better if the cell dies uh <laughs> so um, it, it sounds like a, a very um, 
interesting movie like thing it, it's not really so there is something called a signaling cascade and you know this many proteins are there in in that pathway and and the cascade means it's like a relay race right so that information passes from one protein to the other and the, to the next and the next and eventually the uh, the nucleic acid of the cell is is destroyed the genome of the cell and uh, the proteins are degraded and eventually the cell is is dead so so this uh, you know this response can be of different types sometimes pathogen entry is a response uh, is is a reason is a signal why why this would happen uh, sometimes you know other things like mitochondrial damage could also be a signal for for the cell to commit suicide the process is called apoptosis and it's a very very intricate process and uh, i think we can uh, you can read a little bit more about it uh, again if you contact me separately sreyansh i can send you some some things to read on it what are interferons interferons again are uh, you know uh, response components these are these are cytokines that are released by cells as a response to viral infection and interferon uh, gamma particularly is, is very needed because it it activates a variety of immune system cells including macrophages which which engulf viruses so so these are essentially signaling components that uh, result in uh, you know proliferation or uh, you know multiplication or act activation of our uh, immune components okay then neha did you also have the same question uh rajas wants to know can i share this ppt to our gmail i do not know how that would be possible i can make the ppt available to the organizers um if they have everyone's email id then it can be communicated to everyone is is that a possibility uh, if if the organizers are okay with it i can make the ppt available Yeah, that could be possible. Yeah. Okay. 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 Then uh, Dhruv Gautam wants to know: many viruses are friendly, but these things, Lactobacillus, is a bacteria. Dhruv, it's it's not a virus. Um, but yeah, some viruses. I mean, not all viruses are pathogenic, as we just discussed. Very few of them are pathogenic. Why SARS-CoV-2 lasts longer? Do we compare to what? Compared to uh, the first sars cov or or what uh, lasts longer are, are you talking about long covid so so in that case maybe i can try to say that you know uh, when somebody gets covid obviously there is significant damage that is caused by the virus itself uh, sars cov 2 also you know it has also been uh, isolated from uh, our cerebrospinal fluid so it's also has uh, it does affect neuronal cells it has neurological <clears throat> action as well and uh, the immune response sometimes is in some individuals is is, uh, is relatively uncontrolled and it also causes tissue damage so all of these things kind of combine into long covid it is it is hard to say specifically uh, again varies quite a lot from individual to individual uh, Kushal wants to know, can we create drugs which can stop the mutation of virus? Um, I doubt it, Kushal, because always these mistakes are there at the time that the virus is uh, replicating. And uh, as a result, we uh, uh, the mutations are incorporated and then there is natural selection of whatever gives an advantage. So drugs will not probably be able to solve this process. Okay. Uh, Rim wants to know if uh, she can be unmuted. Is that possible? Rim Barua. Rim, did you have a question? Good evening, ma'am. Huh, hi. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation and explanation. Thank you very much. It was so engaging that I lost track of time. Uh, <laughs> I think it because, also happened to me. I was supposed to finish this within an hour, but uh, I got such good questions that I went on and on. 
Sam, it was very much informative. You started from the uh, evidences of existence of virus in the early civilization. Uh, you gave example of Rameses V. Then you also told us about the discovery of virus, tobacco mosaic virus by Wendell Stanley, and from structure of virus to how it affects the host and how it can be cured and prevented. Overall, it was very amazing. And thank you so much for this enlightening and stimulating presentation. That's all thank I wanted you. to say. Thank you so very much, Rim. And I will make this presentation available. So, uh, you know, if, if any of you want to know more, then you can, I have listed some references at, at the bottom of each slide. So you can look at those. And also places like Protein Data Bank and Electron Microscopy Data Bank, and then Viper, which is a site which shows structure of viruses. If any of you are interested, uh, you know, those sites are available. You can go take a look at virus structure. And it would give me great pleasure if, if other, if uh, the people who attended the talk would, you know, want to learn further uh, more about viruses. Thank you. Then there's a question from YouTube. YouTube, yes. Yeah, he's asking about uh, uh, what is the strongest possible fatal combination of influenza virus possible and how to make vaccine against this? Strongest possible combination? Yes, no, of influenza I virus. I really also. don't want to know. <laughs> it's hard to predict what would be the strongest possible combination. I don't know the name of the person who's asking that question. Uh, again, I don't think there are some attempts at prediction of what mutations might undergo natural selection in the context of SARS-CoV-2 or which would give the virus a selective advantage. Uh, but uh, again, it's it's very hard to predict something like this, right? Uh, so, so I can't say. Uh, vaccines, uh, you know, the hemagglutinin, the part of hemagglutinin that binds to uh, cells, that mutates all the time, uh, which is why every year they say that we have to take a new flu shot. Um, and that is because you know there's a new strain uh, so as i mentioned earlier it there there are scientists who are working towards the possibility of generating um you know um what are called uh, vaccines which will be effective broadly effective vaccines against many many strains all vaccines provide some protection but but very broadly effective vaccines against influenza uh, there are, uh, you know, strategies which which people are taking, uh, like targeting the the portions of hemagglutinin that do not change, or targeting other proteins. Uh, but uh, hopefully, you know, we will see uh, success very soon. Yeah. Um, uh, and this is also have... another. Uh -huh, sure, Piyush, go another ahead. Another question from YouTube, man, from biology and finger tips. You yes. also know does environmental factors affect virus mutations? Um, environmental factors, I mean, I wouldn't say mutation per se, but definitely in terms of, you know, environmental factors, ecological factors, uh, you know, uh, can affect the, the spread, right? A species jumping, all of these things, because, uh, you know, I mean, we, we are seeing that viruses may jump from animals to humans. So that requires some close proximity of, of animals to humans. So that brings uh, ecological factors right there, because if, uh, you know, due to environmental conditions, there is some kind of closeness, then, then the species jumping is an adaptation is relatively easier. Uh, also, you know, I, I do not know that this is something that, you know, I was thinking that uh, we had this major influenza pandemic in, in 1918, and, and a lot of environmental conditions at that time uh, came into it that it was the end of the First World War. Uh, the world did not have any resources. Uh, so much has been spread uh, spread on the war. Uh, there was large scale movement of of troops from one place to another. So all that could have gone into creating a pandemic condition where you know this uh, virus could spread from from one part of the world to another. And and later on, with the other influenza outbreaks, we did not see. We already probably had some immunity, plus um, you know uh, some some vaccines. Plus we had more resources to, to deal with infections with sick people. Uh, so so that probably went into uh, making uh, the uh, you know uh, 
uh, stopping the spread of, of epidemics or pandemics. So, so to answer your question, there are obviously biological as well as uh, uh, you know environmental and ecological factors that go into the, the making of a pandemic, um, but very case specific. Yes. Piyush, are there questions? More questions from YouTube. Otherwise, I will. I just want to. There's also, one more question from from YouTube yes. from yes. Ramila Devi. And she yes. wants to know that uh, how minutes does it take a cell to activate a gene upon infection? How many minutes does it take to activate yes. a gene upon infection? Upon infection, activate a gene. I'm I'm not sure I'm understanding. So, do you mean like a response uh, material? She wants to know about the kinetics of transcriptomic response to infection. Kinetics, kinetics of transcriptomic response. response. Again, very very dependent on environmental factors. Um, the the particular individual, the immune response that uh, is very specific to a particular individual. So there is there is no specific answer to this. Okay, I think uh, Sarthak wants to know why it took a long time to make a vaccine for COVID since there were viruses in the past too and scientists took out a solution for it. Um, actually, Sarthak, I would say that uh, the vaccine for COVID came very fast, very fast because it usually takes a long time uh, because it's, it's not sufficient just to make a vaccine. Uh, you know, you, you create some inactivated virus or you create some, you know, you, you generate some subunit protein of the virus or you generate a chimeric virus. One has to go through all of these regulatory processes that that I showed you, you know, pre preclinical trials, then phase one trial, phase two, phase three. And these cannot be, you know, uh, these cannot be uh, um, overlooked because or uh, all of these has to be followed because otherwise we would not know if a particular vaccine formulation would have, um, you know, any any uh, you know side effect, any very bad side effect or any toxicity. So all of these processes have to go through for every vaccine. Um, so SARS-CoV-2 was relatively new to us. Uh, the vaccine material was made quite fast, but after that, the regulatory approval, even though they were streamlined and made faster. We have to go through the regulatory process so that you know uh, the vaccines are, are we can label them safe, and and all that had to be done. But but we had the knowledge from the past because this mRNA technology people have been working on it for decades, and and during the pandemic it was it was applied uh, very effectively. Also the inactivated virus strategy you know we we knew that for other viruses it it does work. Um, the adenovirus platform, which goes into making Covishield, that platform was already there. And, and the spike protein from SARS-CoV-2 was taken and added to the platform. Uh, but once, once you make a vaccine formulation, one has to go through, you know, is there any batch to batch variation, how to purify it, how to make sure that it's not toxic, how to make sure that all of the uh, clinical trial phases, you know, uh, go through all that and make sure that the formulation is safe and is effective. So all of these things take quite a bit of time. But the initial work was done quite fast because we had previous knowledge. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Shakti wants to know how vaccines protect us from the virus. So vaccines, uh, essentially, they um, uh, what we what we uh, use vaccines for is to raise an immune response, and then some of these immune cells are stored in the memory. So the next time we uh, we see the similar uh, you know, a structure, similar antigen, then the response is very fast. It does not take, you know, seven days to 10 days to raise a response. It happens very quickly. And that is how, uh, you know, vaccines protect us. So it's basically just arming our immune system against a particular virus. And Neha is right, of course, prevention is better than cure. Okay, I think I've answered the vaccine questions. Uh, Ma'am, uh, some of the students want to connect, so I have unmuted them. So we we can ask their questions directly. They can interact directly. Sure. Uh, Shakti, 
do you have any question unmute kar diya shakti do you have any questions sir am i audible now yeah. yes yes i can hear you please go ahead sir actually what is my question is what is the probability of getting the uh, virus when and you are uh, vaccinated sir uh what is the probability of getting what uh, what is the prob if a person is vaccinated and he is getting the covid means how what is the probability of getting it ma'am um again shakti it's completely dependent because everybody's immune system is different right uh which is why these days we talk about personalized medicine everyone's immune system is different the response time the uh, you know the uh, effectiveness of response everything depends on that person's physiology so probability like that cannot be calculated um because again if if people in the whole world would respond in a in a in a similar way uh we would be able to figure out the probability but since everybody's immune system is different and everyone responds in a different way it's hard to uh, put a number to it shakti does that uh, does that answer your question are there <clears throat> any more questions okay, i am trying thank to you ma'am thank you I think Sarah is asking a very interesting question: Why there is a high mutation rate in RNA? Uh, Sarah, because the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase is more prone to making mistakes compared to the other enzymes. Good afternoon, ma'am. I'm yes. Arivan. Yes, you are. Who is this? Kushal. Yes. Please go ahead. Kushal, Madam, my here. question is: uh, Why does only in, in viruses there is uh, rapid variations? Right, because they uh, they mutate, they grow very rapidly. Right, that is why every time a virus is undergoing a, a replication cycle, there are mutations that are introduced, and their timeline is much faster than our timeline, which is why we get a large proportion of mutated viruses very very fast. Thank you, ma'am. One more question. Yes, madam. Why uh, is uh, virus have cell or not? Um. So I'm not. I mean, viruses have to enter cells in order to, um, you know, multiply. Um. So. I think. I mean, I, I'm not sure. I I understand. Um. So. Uh, viruses. Uh. I mean, they. they are so the structure is what you saw uh, it's they are they are not uh, you know bringing their own uh, nuclei or their own cytoplasm or anything like this it is just a container that is made of protein sometimes lipid uh, that contains the uh, genomic material that's it but it has to enter a cell in order to multiply thank you so much ma'am thank you kushal uh i think this another question what are lysogenic and lytic cycles uh so some viruses are lytic in the sense that they would get into a cell they would multiply they would make many copies of themselves and then the cell would burst so cell lysis is is what the virus is doing so it is a lytic cycle on the other hand a virus may incorporate its genome in in a cell um and decide to just not so so essentially it is not making copies of itself it has just incorporated its genome in the um host cell genome and that that uh cycle is called lysogen so it's it's the genome is incorporated but new virus particles are not being made so it's staying quiescent i hope the difference is clear
Aditya wants to know whether there are some dangerous viruses in the icebergs of Antarctica. Aditya, I surely hope not. We are already living through a pandemic. Samrud wants to know, ma'am, can I climate change? Ah, I think. Like ma'am, Shayans want to uh, wants to ask some question. Okay, let's let's take Shayans's question. Shayans, please go ahead. Ma'am, can a virus be killed? How do you kill a virus? You can you can heat it. It would just fragment its its genome after a certain period of time if you heat it if you treat it with chemicals uh, so that it's non-infectious i think we can we can call that killing in fact you know so the vaccine components that we discussed these are inactivated or killed viruses so you basically you know uh, take the viruses and, and heat them or you treat them with some chemical which which cross links their you know surface proteins and all so that they are no longer functional and it fragments their their genome so it's it cannot be utilized for uh, you know, uh, multiplication. So those are the ways to kill a virus. Shayans, is that answering your question? Shayans, are you there? Uh, Ma'am. Uh... Yeah. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, ma'am. First of all, uh, it was I am uh, Ishan Rawat. I'm studying in SOSE Sector 10 in Dwarka, ma'am. All right. So, ma'am, first of all, it was an amazing session, ma'am. Uh, you Thank explained you. everything so well. I honestly did not get bored for a single second, even though I personally am not a huge fan of biology. <laughs> but uh, you explained it so well. Thank and ma'am, my question was that uh, you said viruses have their own DNA and stuff. Right. So ma'am, I remember reading somewhere that mitochondria also has its own DNA. It does. And it can ex exist outside a cell as well. So ma'am, are like viruses and mitochondria similar in some ways? <laughs> that is a question that would require a lot of explanation, Ishan. And there's been a lot of studies on the, you know, mitochondrial DNA. Uh, what is it similar to something or the other? Is it similar to bacteria? Um, you know, how have we evolved? How, how have our cells evolved? So it, the question you're asking goes to the very basics of evolution, right? Um, I don't think I can actually, you know, even attempt to answer it in this session. But uh, because, because it will require a very long explanation. Uh, but if you can get in touch with me later, I would be very happy to give you some material to read, which would help you understand, um, you know, how our cells have evolved and mitochondrial DNA, where has it come from and what are the theories on it and different types of theories on it. So, so that would, I think, be interesting to you. And I'm, I'm very happy to know that even though you don't like biology, you like the session. And um, I would, if you, if you get in touch with me later, I will, and that's a very interesting question. Uh, that there is there is no easy answer, uh, but there there has been a lot of studying done. There are many theories, and and I would really like to send some literature on this to you, so you can you can go through this. Right, ma'am. Thank you so much. I'll uh, make sure I contact you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Isha. Yeah, I had good one... afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. I'm Samrat Ismalali from KV Udpi. Uh, ma'am, yes, I have a I question see. that, uh, yes. uh, like, can climate change impact uh, the new increase uh, in new species of viruses in the future? Uh, <laughs> I do not have the expertise to answer that, Samrud, uh, very honestly. Uh, there is definitely a possibility because when there are ecological changes, when there is climate change, uh, there are, uh, again, there could be more instances of species jumping. Uh, from one organism to another, um, the ecological barriers, to some extent, if they are they are not there, um, then then definitely there could be uh, instances of of more species jumping, more adaptation of of novel viruses to humans. 
uh, that's where I have to leave it because because there are experts who are working on these areas. But um, uh, I I would say from my understanding, definitely there's a possibility. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. There is a question one from YouTube from Bharati yes. at fingertips. He is asking, can virus can cross uh, blood brain barriers? They are able to do that. Some viruses can actually, yes, some viruses can. And uh, SARS CoV 2, there are, uh, I saw a few reports where it has been isolated from cere cerebrospinal fluid. So so it is it is a possibility. Some viruses are known to do that. Neurotropic viruses, they, they do. Are, are capable of crossing the blood brain barrier. Ma'am, Sarah wants to ask some questions, so I'm unmuting him. Yes. Unmuting him. Sure. Ma'am, uh, good evening. I'm Sarah. Yes, hi, Sarah. Hello. Good evening, you had some, I'm Good Sarah. evening. You had some very good questions. Tell me. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, I want to ask that in this session, you have explained that when viruses comes, uh, viruses uh, inhibits the replication of DNA of human nucleus. Yes, you have explained now. Right, 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 right. So why? Why the virus DNA comes in contact with the human nucleus DNA? How can it come in contact with the human DNA? Is is that the question? Yes, and, yes. and why it comes in contact with it? So I wouldn't say it's coming directly in contact with the human DNA. That's not how it happens, Sarah. But some viruses do replicate in the nucleus. So after entering the cytoplasm, their genome uh, may go to the nucleus to replicate. And it's, it's not a question of direct contact so much uh, as to taking up resources. So for making our proteins, for making our, uh, you know, uh, multiplying uh, our nucleic acids, we do require uh, quite a lot of resources like, you know, nucleotides, um, amino acids, these are all raw material. And if a virus basically yes, takes over and all of these resources are diverted to, you know, to the multiplication of the virus, then basically it's like our cells are starved because they are not getting the resources and the resources are being diverted. And viruses are very interesting ways of diverting the resources. I'll just, you know, take a minute to explain one particular instance. Uh, you know messenger RNA. Sarah, are you familiar with messenger RNA? Yes, ma'am, I'm familiar. Right. So our messenger RNA has a cap. It has a cap at one end, and that cap protects our messenger RNA. Now, influenza virus, and that, that cap is also a recognition signal. So our ribosomes recognize the cap, right? Now, influenza virus has a very interesting mechanism. It takes the caps from our mRNA and puts it on its own mRNA. So what will happen here? All our resources will be diverted towards making influenza proteins because now we are looking at, I mean, our, our cells, our ribosomes cannot identify our own mRNA anymore. It is identifying the influenza virus mRNAs. So this is just an example. But if the resources are utilized completely by for virus replication and virus transcription and virus translation, then there is nothing left for our own cells. So we go through a starvation period. Ma'am, that... there is one another question. Yes. That when a virus RNA enters a cell, a human cell, it gets converted right. into DNA. Why it gets converted into DNA? No, no, it doesn't convert into DNA. See, viruses can have as their genomic material, they can have DNA, they can have RNA, whatever they're carrying their, their genetic code in. What happens is they release it. Uh, remember, a virus is a container. So the con it's a very tight container, if you want to think of it that way, uh, because the, the most precious thing is the 
genetic code, which is carried in either DNA or RNA. And this is surrounded by a protein uh, layer, and then in some cases, a lipid layer. And that is forming the uh, lid of the container, if you want to put it that way. Now, what happens within the cell is that this lid will come off and the genome will be released. It can be RNA, it can be DNA, but then the genome has the code. Now it will get multiplied and from the genome, mRNA and protein will be made, plus the genome will get multiplied. So now you have thousands, millions of copies of the genome and many, many copies of the proteins. Now those are being made by our cell because our cell has been fooled into thinking that this is what we need to make. These are cellular resources. Now this viral genome and the viral proteins will come together to make new virus. And those are again going out and infecting other cells. So that's the process. Nothing is getting converted into DNA. Whatever the virus has brought, whatever is within it, whatever be its genome, RNA or DNA, that is going to be released within the cell. Yes, ma'am. Sarah, is that answering your question? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. All right. I got it. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Someone is asking, and that's a very good question. What is the percentage of alcohol a hand sanitizer should contain to kill viruses? So you know what the alcohol does in case of enveloped viruses is that it destroys the lipid layer. So that is about, I think, 70% alcohol uh, is, is good. To, to kill the, uh, to destroy the lipid layer. And if the lipid layer is gone, then the embedded glycoproteins are gone. But the non-enveloped viruses require a lot more alcohol because there's no lipid. It's a very stable protein shell. So, so that would be a requirement of more uh, alcohol. Ma'am, Disha wants to ask some question. Yes. I have an invitation. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much for your valuable time. Uh, thank, thank you for you giving. Sure. Thank you for giving uh, it to us to clear our doubts. Uh, ma'am, my question is, can uh, a person have both bacterial disease and a viral disease at the same time? Yes, it is. It is quite possible. You know, when you are get, you have a pathogenic infection, could be bacteria or virus. Uh, at the same time, because your immune system is, is already dealing with one pathogen, there could be uh, things called opportunistic infections. And, and that is, you know, quite common in many viral diseases, HIV, for example. Uh, when the person's immune system is weak, there could be bacterial pathogens that also infect. Um, so uh, those are called opportunistic pathogens. And uh, sometimes death is because of the, op the, the, the symptoms caused by the opportunistic pathogen. Disha, was that, did that answer your question? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, does it slow down the process of uh, the multiplication of the virus? Mm, that again is a very case to case uh, specific uh, question. I mean, I can see it going either way uh, because it could be that the immune system is engaged elsewhere, so the virus is multiplying very fast or because these resources are taken up by another pathogen, so the virus is multiplying slower. Uh, but it's, it's certainly not a very pleasant situation for the host who is being infected. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, ma'am, uh, some students want your email ID so, so that they can contact you. Uh, that that is possible shall i share my email id uh organizers if there can be some guidance regarding this yeah so we can just paste it uh, on the chat box chat box okay i am pasting my email id here and it's also available of course in the uh, iit delhi website you can find my email id Oh, sorry, I send it to privately. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, just a second. All right, now it should be available to all. 
and also it is available on the IIT Delhi website. Ma'am, Neha wants to ask some question. So sure. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Good evening, Neha. Uh, ma'am, uh, I wanted to ask a question. Yes. Um, ma'am, uh, why some vaccines have live pathogens and others have killed pathogens? Um, Neha, both are effective, right? I mean, because they have all gone through all kinds of effectiveness tests. Uh, live pathogens meaning it's not like anyone's giving the actual virus. It is, uh, it is some modified version of the virus, right? It's either <clears throat> a chimera with with another uh, virus particle which is not very infectious, uh, or you know the virus has been grown in such a way that um, you know it it has lost its capability. It it can still multiply but it's lost its capability to cause disease. So some limited multiplication is there. So those are called attenuated vaccines. So both of them are effective. It just depends on the strategy one takes, right? So for example, the Salk uh, polio vaccine and the Sabine polio vaccine, both of them are effective. One of them is a killed vaccine and the other is an attenuated vaccine. Okay, so it's thanks. just different, different strategies that different yes. people take. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, there's a question one from YouTube from Akshit Pal. Yes. He wants to know why do uh, disease causing viruses originate from bat? Originate from? Bats, bats. Bats, yes. That is again a very, very good question. Uh, bats so far have been implicated in so many different diseases, including Ebola and then, uh, you know, fruit bats. Then, um, you know, the, the first lots of coronavirus diseases, you know, SARS coronavirus, uh, then the, the current SARS CoV 2. Um, I would say. Uh, Maybe they can harbor different types of viruses, but they never get sick. I, <laughs> their, their immune system must be something formidable. Plus, they are able to act as a reservoir, and uh, this can be transmitted to to different, uh, you know, different uh, other organisms. Um, yeah, I, I don't really know. I mean, I, I don't really have a, have a good answer to this. Uh, but I know that there were there are different uh, there there was there is you know a lot of research continuing along those lines as why uh, bats are good reservoirs for so many viral diseases. I think Samrud has a question. Samrud, do you have another question? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, can be acid useful to kill uh, the lipid layer on the virus? Can what? Ma'am, can acid be useful to kill the lipid layer on the virus? Um. Yes, but then, you know, depending on what kind of acid you're using, it would also harm you, right? Ma'am, if it is like that, then uh, we like we could make a thing so that uh, we could divert the virus which is inside our body towards the stomach so that uh, inside the stomach there is hydrochloric acid. So it may I be really killed there. I would not recommend this at all. <laughs> acid is not a therapy. <laughs> Please do not try to experiment none of you with uh, with things that can be harmful to you or alcohol either for that matter only in hand sanitizers it is okay thank you ma'am thank you is there any more question
I think if there are more questions, people are welcome to write to me. I have shared my email ID, so I'll be very happy to respond and to give appropriate material for studying if, if they want. Sure, sure. I didn't want to stop it, <laughs> but <laughs> because I, I was enjoying this question. Because this, this guys, they have so interesting, interesting questions. I mean, starting from this very, RNA very and polymerase. Yes, very interesting. Oh, very, very nice. I'm amazed. By yeah, yeah, I'm amazed by their depth. Yes, already. Yeah. And good At ideas. Stage. I hope some of you would come into biology, virology research. I, I really hope that that happens in future. Indeed, and you can see that bi virology yeah. research is very, very important, right? So that we uh, never lose another two years of our lives, right? So it's it's very important. True. I think uh, you have already inspired many people, many kids. Uh <laughs> so that they can take up this thing in, in near future, you know, they will try to solve this, uh, uh, you know, develop antiviral drugs, uh, vaccines, stuff like that. Right. Yeah. So, any more questions or shall we wrap it, wrap it up? No, Shomik, sh what do you suggest? Right. Shall we? Uh, Shomik has a class. He's in a class. Okay. He's in a class. So I think yeah. we can end it here. And again, I've shared my email ID. So uh, students okay. are very, very welcome uh, to, to write to me. And uh, okay. also email ID is also available on the IIT Delhi website. Uh, so please feel free. And okay. So let me, uh, this let me, yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, with this, let me uh, kind of conclude this session by sure. with few words. Um, so first of all, Thank you, Professor Banerjee, for uh, for a wonderful lecture. And I'm sure, along with me, this all, all guys they they learned something new, something exciting. And uh, yeah, so thanks again. Um, now it's a time to thank people who are you know part of this team and you know doing a wonderful job you know to bringing this this lectures to the to to the young people. So first of all, uh, I would like to thank um, Professor Pritha Chandra, professor in Department of HSS, and she's also associated dean of this program. And I would like to thank Professor Ravi, Professor Jay, Professor Rajendra, Professor Swamik Siddhanta, Professor Divya Nair. And uh, I would like to thank all the deans and our di director, Professor Rangan Banerjee, for their continuous support and encouragement. And we have an amazing team you know, supporting Mr. Gaurav Kuldeep Renu, who worked tirelessly to make sure that this program runs very smoothly. And uh, yeah, so, so thank you uh, guys. And special mention to various electronic and print media for circulating our program. And now there are many, many, uh, you know, participants that we are, we are seeing. And um, we are going to have many more this kind of lectures um, under this SciTech Screen Initiative. So stay tuned. And last but not the least, I'd like to thank all of you, all the participants, for uh, your active participation in this interactive session. I mean, it was amazing. I, I didn't even notice that it's more than one hour of interactions. It was fantastic. So with this, uh, we end this session, and uh, I'd like I look forward to seeing you all again in the uh, in the upcoming lectures. And Professor Banerjee, again, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. And thank you to all the participants. I had a great time. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. So with this, uh, take care and uh, have a nice weekend. And we'll meet again in the near uh, in, in the future. Just thank you. Bye bye.